happy rent on a rundown place. There ain't no view, but there's lots of space in my heart. The heart that you own. Pay the rent, pay it right on time. Baby, I pay you every single dime. My heart. The heart that you own. Used to be I could love you for free. Way back before you bought the property. I paid daily on what one was mine. Lord, I probably owe you for these tears that I cry. Hey, yeah, yeah. I pay rent on a rent down place. There ain't no view, but there's lots of space in my heart. The heart that you own. Struggle each night to find a new way to pay what I owe just so I can stay. I ain't up to so you can't throw me out. I've loved you for years, don't know where I'd go now. Hey, yeah, yeah. I pay rent on a rent down place. There ain't no view but there's life. Face in my heart, the heart that you own. Baby, we'll be right back with Dwight Yoakam and Jerry Peters. Jimmy Rogers, the guy I was talking about, wrote called Hobo Bill back in like 32. This guy, he was from Meridian, Mississippi. He ended up out in Texas as a brakeman. And uh, there, were a lot of, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of Chinese uh, railroad workers and black railroad workers that he, was, he worked with right. and worked around. And so he started writing songs, listening to them sing, and ended up in New York City like in 28, 1928. He was right. the first country music star ever re really on record. And it was, it was cut out of New York, not in Nashville. He went to New York City and cut. He died of TB in a studio, in a session. Died, yeah, in a studio. And, and wrote T for Texas. Uh, I'm trying to remember the other stuff he wrote. Real fast. Mule Skinner Blues. Hey, good morning, Captain. Good morning, Shine. Do you need so a Mule Skinner? He, he predates the Carter Hank family? Senior. Yeah, no, about the same time. The okay. Carters were in the 20s. Right. And they, are on the, they were on the Opry. And he went to New York. He was up in New York cutting. He was the, he was a bigger star than them though right, actually at the time. Right. But he died in like '32 or something, right? You know, at the beginning at the height of the depression. And so we've at most. Uh, it's almost kind of like pre-war, post-war. Right, right. You know, baseball players and stuff. It's like he's like from a former time. So we, a lot of people aren't conscious of him. But Mule Skinner Blues was his. It's a great song. He yodeled a lot. He was like you know, uh, the blue yodeler. Right. Anyway, right. but it was all blues-based stuff. It was nothing more than blues. See, anyway. it's amazing because you you never when you when you listen to people country, talk yeah. about country music, it 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 takes on this. It's as if it were a separate entity. Because yeah. if you listen to Hank Williams, I mean, it is blues. That's all oh, it is. Yeah. It's That's Bessie totally. Smith. It's Hank Williams. Well, he was raised in Montgomery, Alabama. I mean, he grew up literally on the street, and I believe. It was a black shoe shine man because he was a shoe shine uh, boy, Hank, for a time that taught him to play the guitar initially, and then you know he took from there. But he did a thing. He used to do a bit. I cut a song on the new album that's kind of emulative of, of his alter ego. He he cut records under the name Hank Luke the Drifter because the record label at the time, this is in the 40s, right. thought that the stuff was too politically motivated and too uh, provocative, right. topically, to put on radio. In 1947, they said, no, 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 you can't put that out because it'll ruin your career, your secular career right. will be. So he cut under this name, Luke the Drifter. Did you ever see Andy Griffith in the movie uh, Facing the Crowd? Well, yeah. You're yeah. Seen, yeah. A lunatic. This movie is like whacked. You know, Andy Griffith? It's the best. You'll never believe it's Andy Griffith. Walter Matthau and, and uh, uh, Patricia Neal. Right. 
And the, fir the first film that Lee Remick ever did, the little baton twirler he married him. That's right. What a, what a maniac. I mean, what a myopic megalomaniac. It's about TV, and it's cut in 1957. Yeah. And it, like, predates network or broadcast news, and it's brilliant. Well, you know, this is something, you know, they're getting ready to do a remake of it. Oh, they are? Over at Warner Brothers. No, I didn't know you that, because they own it. Yes, they do. Well, I wrote a song about it. it, it was, it's called, because his name and the, his character in this thing is called uh, Lonesome Roads. Lonesome so Rose. I wrote a, wrote a song called Lonesome Roads, and goes, it's like, it's like an old Hank Luke the Drifter thing. It's, where did I go wrong? You know, I've never had a clue. I must have just been born no good. that I could do Was it just my fate in life to end up here this way Lost and all alone Or a black lamb that's gone astray Lonesome road Yeah. The, the tie-in is all I'm there. I'm telling you, you ought to tell, your, you ought to tell your folks yep. to, to get on it. Because, I didn't know they were remaking it. Yes. Well, it was originally going to be done a long time ago oh. with, uh, with a different cast. And I won't tell you who was supposed to be in it, but you, there's a reason I know as much about it as I do. Yeah. So it's, you ought to check it out. Now, let me ask you, when you were growing up... Is it going to be a contemporary piece? They're going to yeah. do it like now, obviously. Yeah, they'd have to, because, yeah. you know, I, I, my attitude is that would be... As it was contemporary for them, then, it must be contemporary. Now. Yeah, exactly. For them. That's what makes it yeah. so uh, so potent. How come you know so much? I mean, I, I'm curious because most of the folks that that yeah. I know, it's really all bull. And I'm just making it up as I go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, baby, that's my line. <laughs> but where does where did this love for this music come out of? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean. You know, as analytically uh, um, cerebral <laughs> as I usually am, and anal I don't know. I don't know. I guess maybe my grandparents. Uh, I only had one set of grandparents that I actually knew, and they had a profound impact on my life. Uh, my grandfather's name was Luther Tibbs in Erlene, and he was a coal miner for like 40 years. And these were people, mountain people, very, very uh, simplistic and yet very... Uh, very wise, you yeah. know. I don't know that I'll ever uh, uh, completely come to grips with uh, the importance, the impact that he had on my life. And I think that it's almost an unconscious debt that I feel I owe. And and uh, I just, I, I you know, I moved out here about 15 years ago, and I had a lot of time alone mm. to think. You know, people said, you know, a weird place, to, you know, for a country singer to be based in L.A. I said, no. I said, actually, the juxtaposition of it, I think, gives me a perspective that I wouldn't have if I'd never left. Right. You know? It's right. The, and there's a lot of kinetic energy in a town like L.A. that I, that I don't get someplace else. And, uh, you know, it's the the irritation necessary to stimulate the muscle to create right. the pearl, hopefully. Right. You know? When you, do you go, do you get back to the town you grew up in very often? I played a couple of dates in, well, where I was born. I was born in Pikeville, Kentucky, and then I was, we moved up to Columbus, Ohio. So I go to both. I, you know, I play down in southeast Kentucky, and I play up in Ohio. Ah. But, well, uh, hold on, baby, because yeah. we'll, we'll be right back with Dwight Yoakam. Oh, we've been going? Yeah, baby. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> <laughs> Black shining hair. Oh, she had my baby and caused me to care. Then 
Ranchero music is what yes. well my friend called it. The second day I thought he was telling my story, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, she ends up dead. <laughs> oh, no. Week she ends up dead. So. Not this weekend, please. <laughs> now, now let, me, let me ask you, I've asked this question to a couple of other folks who play country. Why do you think there is, why do you think there are not a whole lot of black country artists that we know of. I mean, we know about Charlie Pride. What did Jerry say earlier? Uh, uh, subcultural right, segregation. Subcultural yeah. segregation. It's the same reason that there aren't a lot of uh, uh, hillbilly artists currently mm. who make the jump, I mean, ironically, because it's where rock came from, to rock and roll radio. Mm. I mean, I've done, I've done cuts that were rock palatable, that were just rock and roll cuts. Right that were, they, MTV refused to play because, and, and MTV had played us up, they had, I had right. you know, been on the format to the point that I had success on country radio. Once I had a hit on country radio, I was ostracized from MTV. So really? it cuts both ways. And it, I think, literally boils down to the fact that we've, you know, uh, we're still a society that's grappling with uh, uh, a segregationist kind of past and, you know, we're, you know, radio in the in the United States is is still uh, there's a necessity to an extent to to be formatted. Uh, there's 10,000 radio stations right. in this country, so they have to because they're commercial based. You know, uh, it's commercially based radio. They have to appeal to a listener and they have to get you know Arbitron ratings right. and all that right. stuff. And so there's a need to service a certain audience and let an audience know what they're hearing when they come there. But I just think that it's still it's, in answer to that question in not a very succinct, succinct fashion, but as best I can. I think it's just that there's a kind of a subcultural segregation that goes on uh, even in the arts. Yeah. Otis Redding was doing stuff that was, you know, <laughs> if it had been a white guy doing it and cutting it in Nashville instead of in Memphis or in Muscle Shoals, it had been country music. Right. So I think it's just, uh, you know, the labels we apply to, to music that limits us. It does, it does, because you, you know, they're talking about this resurgence of country music and, the, you know, the crossover between rock and roll and the other day. But there is something, there is, a, there is that, that caramel, that melted caramel yeah. that you have, that, that George Jones has, oh, yeah. that, you know, that, the, that all those cats that, are, that you think of when you think of country, you know, kind of make you want to go home and get all in All the bed. way back to Jimmy Rogers. Yes, like yes. People who were totally influenced by it. Are those the guys you grew up listening to? Well, I started educating myself because by the time I was, you know, I, I grew up for the greatest part in the 60s. You know, radio had, ex had exploded at that point. Uh, musical radio exploded in the 60s. I was able to hear and receive an education almost by osmosis, by just pushing the car radio button, right. you know, throughout the 60s and hear uh, the Motown stuff come down from Detroit simultaneously hear the stack stuff out of out of memphis and the the british stuff which was an uh, an english interpretation of what of, of american r and b and you know, like right. you know the stones and the beatles were reinterpreting especially the stones when you listen to stuff like uh, get off my cloud uh, or satisfaction they're literally emulating in their own way you know what was early 60s soul music right. you know the supreme stuff and the grooves that they were doing like you know i so i was hearing that simultaneous to hearing the the colloquial stuff that i grew up with right. you know from being out of you know right. southeast kentucky pikeville and floyd county in that area of kentucky uh the mountain music so anyway yeah now you i i it's it's reported that you always talk it's about important. being, a, yeah, really, you know. <laughs> rumor you, has it. Rumor <laughs> has it that, that you spend a lot of time in your head and that you read a great deal. What's, what you are would, you reading? <laughs> that Is rumor would only circulate among uh, former girlfriends and current... <laughs> <laughs> current <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, how do you, what you am must, I reading? Yeah, what are you reading now? What am I reading? I'm trying to finish a Kinky Friedman novel. Yes. Um, you have the Kinky's yes, writing? Yes, yes, yes. 
I wrote character. The last thing I read, he did a thing called Musical Chairs, which was his latest novel. Um, and uh, I'm trying to get through, a, a started on a, on a book called Killing Mr. Watson. Pete Dexter is another writer that I'm kind of a fan of right now. These are just all novels. Right. Uh, Pete Dexter wrote Paris Trout. Yeah, oh, uh, he's wonderful. Yes, the, the book Hopper is great. Yeah, the book is the book is fantastic. Uh, yeah, the, the TV and movie. Dead, the, Deadwood. Yeah. Um, Deadwood is another thing he wrote, a yes, western about yes. the last year of life of uh, Wild Bill Hickok and his and his sidekick. Uh, and it's a very historically accurate book. Right. We're talking about the right. historical right. accuracy of this stuff, especially with westerns. I think it's it's uh, very gripping to read something that's so historically accurate accurate that's based in that time period in our yeah. country because it's like there's no glamour to this no it's all kind of a cesspool of life that you know occurred at the point so i'm very i'm pete dexter uh and i'm reading a lot of kind of esoteric stuff things it's, that are you ought to get this book called ishmael i'm trying to ishmael. turn yeah by daniel quinn you're talking about esoteric books yeah. this is this is one that you'll read. that'll uh the take watchers some time. is another thing i finished about watchers years, is great yeah read, yeah, yeah. Uh, read that while I was doing the last album. I was at home at night. I'd get home from, you know, I'd be keyed up and not go to bed for a couple, three hours and sit there and read The Watchers. Now, see, a lot of people feel like they can't do that. You know, it's, you talk to actors sometimes. They say, oh, I, I go home and I, I'm just so up and I, I can't do anything. Because I read in the bathroom. Yeah. I'm a big advocate bathroom of putting, reading. stacking books. It's the truth. I told this to Kirstie It's Kirstie the most Alley. focused moment That's right. of your this day. This is what I said. <laughs> this is what I said. Dwight, you've been I'm with the wrong you. women, honey. You I'm need to be you. with me. It's the most because <laughs> and when you see me wander off with that kind of distant look in my that's eyes. That's okay. Just and check that, the bathroom that, in a minute or two. You know where I'm it. headed. <laughs> it is the truth. I feel a thought coming on. <laughs> <laughs> And it's the place you have they to relax. They call it. They call it anal retentiveness, don't they? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh. And on that you can note, edit that, right? <laughs> we'll be right back with Dwight Yo. Yay! Well, Dwight, I think we have done more for literature and bathrooms in this and, country yeah. than anyone knows, and yeah. I'm thrilled you came. I've been, it's been wonderful to spend this this bathroom moment with <laughs> you and Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, you the greatest. You guys want to take us out? Sure, let's do. We'll see you tomorrow. Surrounded by a million reeds, we start making too soon. Oh, I was just standing. I was just standing alone in this room. Alone in this room. I was just thinking. How I still want you oh, nobody else Yeah, I was just thinking I was just thinking All to myself All to myself Thanks for playing with me, Gary.